Hello and welcome to this course on control systems. Here is a diagram for a formula-based automatic continuous time feedback control system. Basically, what happens is you set the controls and the feedback element kicks in to make sure that your output is what your controls are set to. If there is any kind of discrepancy, an error signal will be generated which will cause the controller to react to ensure that the output is what in fact you have set with your controls. But what else is there besides this? We can have an open loop feed forward instead of feedback system, in which case there is no monitoring of the output to ensure that it is exactly what you've set. We can have a manual control system where humans continuously control some quantity without any feedback at all. Or we can have an artificial intelligence self-learning situation as in the case of a robot where the robot by experience modifies itself. We can also have a discrete time controller that uses some sort of sequential process where time is not an issue. We are not studying those type of controllers in this course. But we need to make a comparison between analog and digital controllers nonetheless. The digital controller has the advantage of being able to be used in many different systems because you simply have to modify the program code instead of rewiring the circuitry or changing the hardware. It can implement more complex functions than you can do in uh, simple analog electronics. And finally, it can interface directly to both digital and analog hardware sensors and actuators, which would be a problem for a purely analog system. But it also has its disadvantages because it's not suitable for continuous control in most cases. Of course, we can raise the sample frequency and increase the sample size, and we can reduce the quantization errors to any desired level, and in that case, it begins to approximate a con continuous control system. But in very fast applications, it might not be possible to eliminate the small amount of time between taking your samples. And finally, one of the disadvantages, it can be more expensive for simple systems. If you have a simple system that does not require very much control function, it's imperative that we do not increase its cost and complexity by adding analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion, which is, would be required in most other control systems. Okay, now we get to a little discussion of mathematical modeling. Mathematical modeling of any system is where we use mathematics to describe the behavior and it helps us in the design and building process to use mathematics in this way. A mathematical model of a continuous feedback controller will involve differential equations. And this is necessary to stabilize the control output against hunting. Hunting means that we send the output in one direction and it goes past the point that we want it to go and the error control brings it back. But it brings it back too far so then it has to turn around and move in the other direction. So hunting is basically oscillation around a desired point. And this would happen in an undamped or underdamped system. Sluggish response, on the other hand, is the reaction of a system to too much damping. The time is, it takes time, the response time of the device is slowed down and this would be totally unacceptable where a reaction time is required, such as in flying aircraft, spaceships, or robots. 
constants must be carefully chosen and the possible effect of unknown variables minimized in order to get these desired outcomes. The design task is, however, simpler and more manageable through the use of the Laplace transform and the transfer function. Finally, we are going to just graphically describe this condition to you so that you can better appreciate why we need to use these differential equations in our control systems. Consider, first of all, a control case where no differential equations are in effect. An air conditioner or refrigerator has a motor. When the motor is on, things are getting colder. When the motor is off, things are getting hotter. You may, in fact, set a temperature on your control system, whether it's a, a remote for the air conditioner or a dial inside of your refrigerator, you dial in some desired temperature. But in order to get that temperature, the thing has to switch on and off. And therefore, it's impossible for you to get that temperature all the time. When the thing is switched off, it's getting hotter. When the thing is switched on, it's getting colder. So what happens in practice is that the temperature oscillates up and down above and below the actual temperature that you hope to achieve. In the case of air conditioners with some sort of digital control, it's extremely precise. What happens is the air conditioner switches on when the temperature reaches a degree above the temperature you have set on the controller and it switches off when the temperature drops a degree below what you have set on your controller. So we can see that the behavior, overall behavior of the system, is that it continually oscillates, it continually oscillates above and below your desired condition. And that would be a completely undamped situation where no attempt is made to control this oscillation. And that behavior is fine for an air conditioner or a refrigerator, but it's quite unacceptable when you're having an aircraft. So consider now a situation where we have the flight control surfaces of a high-flying, high-powered aircraft where response time is absolutely necessary and control has to happen with split-second timing. You have the ailerons, the elevator, and the rudder. These are the three principal uh, surfaces on the airfoil in order to control its flight. These positions of these things, let us just talk about the rudder for a second. The position of the rudder is fed back to the control system via some kind of shaft encoder which is mounted on the shaft of the rudder. So that sends the, the error signal because it tells the control mechanism where the rudder actually is. The pilot, on the other hand, sends the rudder where he wants it to go with his flight controls. So consider the fact that this rudder may be very large mass and heavy, and it requires hydraulics to make it move. And furthermore, it's getting considerable pressure on it from the air that's flowing over its surface. So what happens is the pilot makes a change in the controls. The rudder starts to swing to obey his command. But because of its mass and because the system's not set up properly, when it reaches the point where it's actually supposed to stop, it doesn't quite stop there. The inertia carries it slightly further on. And when it finally comes to a standstill, it's gone too far past the point that he really wants it to go. So what happens is the error system sends it back in the direction of it where it actually should be. But now on the other hand, once it starts moving, because of its gigantic mass, it can't come to a standstill on a dime. So it goes past the where it's supposed to stop and keeps going a little way. It's now too far the other side. So that is the situation that a proper control system is set up to eliminate. The damping of the system must be so good that it comes to the point and stops, which in to some extent needs uh, some sort of advanced knowledge to counteract all these various conditions. The situation is made worse by the fact that we're not only considering the inertia of the actual mass, 
but we're also considering the fact that there are additional unknown pressures on either side of the tail fin, which would be dependent on the speed of the aircraft through the air, and in fact on the density of the air through which it's flying at the same time. So now you can see why a, con a, simple, a simple sounding control system can get incredibly complicated. So just some terminology, the hunting, as we said before, is typically an underdamped situation of the differential equations, which means that it continues to hunt for the exact position, going one side or other of it, and gradually settling down until it finally reaches the exact position. So it's, this, in essence, a damped oscillation. And the sluggish response, on the other hand, is a situation that's so heavily damped that its reaction time is completely slowed, and even though it doesn't go past the point you want it to go, it still takes an unnaturally long amount of time to get there. So hopefully that gives you some sort of idea of where we're going. Thanks for watching, and in the next lecture, we will show you how very uh, similar the equations are, even when developed from different control conditions. See you in the next video.